Okay, so so yeah, my name is Chip. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a startup called Claypot AI, which is a machine learning platform for real-time machine learning. And I also teach machine learning system design at Stanford. Um, I usually start the talk with, um, I'm a bit like, I'm very excited to be here, but I'm so a bit nervous to go after Mate because like you said, he is a visionary in this space. And I don't think there's no way I'm gonna top his talk. So please be patient with me. Um, so anyone here, uh, is from Vietnam. I'm very hopeful he asks every talk, but I'm not sure if um, anyone here, um, but usually I never see anyone from uh, from Vietnam. Okay, I guess no, no one then. Um, okay, so yes, okay, finally. Um, thanks for coming. I know that's pretty late in Vietnam. Um, hey, Lin. So today I'm going to talk about machine learning platform for online predictions and continual learning. So a trend that we have, uh, I have noticed in the last few years is that the industry is moving toward online predictions and continual learning. And one common denominator for both of them are um, that they both require good monitoring solutions. So in this talk, um, Ideally, we want to cover our own three topics, all our predictions, monitoring, and continual learning. But because of the limited time, so we will, I will try to cover the first two topics first. And if we have time, we're going to go over continual learning. And um, I will find events like this a little bit hard uh, to give talks to because I don't have a good sense of what people are interested in or what you have already seen a lot. So please feel free to ask questions or stop me at any point. Uh, and I know that I have an accent, so sometimes I speak really fast. So feel free to like tell me to slow down as well. Nice, I see a lot of people from Vietnam here. Okay, so the first is online predictions. I think I believe that at this point, uh, people have pretty much uh, know the difference. Like a lot of people have uh, are, are very much familiar with the discussions between batch predictions and online predictions. So batch prediction is when predictions are computed per, uh, periodically, like maybe like once a day. So before requests arrive, and online predictions are when is when predictions are computed on demand after prediction requests arrive. So um, batch predictions is uh, the problem with batch prediction is that it's non-adaptive. So uh, for so because the predictions are computed before requests arrive. You can't take into account relevant information to make relevant uh, predictions. And it shows a lot in tasks like recommended systems or dynamic pricing. And another problem with batch prediction is the cost. So um, when, when you generate batch predictions, you tend to generate uh, predictions for all the possible requests out there. So uh, we just talked to a company recently, and they have about 3 million users. So they generate predictions for these 3 million users daily. However, they only have like only a small fraction of these users log into the platform daily. So which means that's like 99% of their computer predictions actually not used, which is a huge waste of compute power. Uh, so online predictions, uh, the big challenge is the latency because predictions are computed after request. So you would need a a machine learning model uh, that can return prediction requests very fast because users don't like waiting. So, so batch predictions, uh, the workflows looks uh, look like this. Uh, so you tend you you good generate predictions offline in batch, and a lot of um, I think for a lot of companies load these pre-computed predictions into a key value store like DynamoDB or Redis to reduce the latency at prediction time. And when as applications, when a prediction request arrives, they're gonna fetch the pre-computed predictions. So not all use cases need online predictions. So batch prediction works pretty well for a lot of tasks like churn predictions or is a lifetime value. So like if you want to like uh, predict who what users are leave the platform, it can probably run that like uh, once a month or once a week. This is fine. Um, so, so with online predictions, uh, so online predictions, uh, there are two different types of online predictions. So the first is that you do online predictions, but with batch features. So batch features are features that are computed offline, for example, like product embeddings. So imagine that you want to do session-based recommender systems. So you might want to look into all the products that a user has seen in the last in the last half an hour. And, um, when uh, so so based on the items that users have seen in the last half an hour, you want to get the embeddings for these items, and you want to like add them together. 
to uh, to create a feature embedding, and then it generates the recommended items based on this uh, embeddings, uh, pre-computed embeddings. So the embeddings are usually computed um, beforehand and load into a key value store, um, so, so that you reduce the latency at um, prediction time. Um, so, so another level of like online predictions is what you want to do with, with online features. So in the case of embeddings, you can compute embeddings offline. Uh, however, for tasks, uh, for, for a lot of tasks, you might want to get features that computed online. So for example, if you want uh, to calculate, um, to, to see like what products should be trending right now, you might want to look into the number of views that own products have in the last 30 minutes. So um, to compute the number of views a product has in the last 30 minutes, you want to compute that features, um, just as features online. So the workflow is that like you compute um, batch features like embedding offline, you load that into a key value store, and then um, at prediction time, you will look into like what features, what online features, what features are needed for this specific request, and then if it's like a batch features, you fetch it from key value store. And if it's online features, you compute that from the recent click stream. So you can either compute that using um, using a Lambda functions, uh, like you can have a microservices uh, running a Lambda function to compute the number of views uh, of a product has in the last 30 minutes. However, Lambda has um, running it that way has a lot of uh, problems. So one problem is that Lambda functions is stateless. Um, I want to check in, like, how is everyone doing? Uh, I haven't seen. Um, yeah. OK, good. So yeah, so I we have a difficult time trying to understand, like, how the audience um, receives the talk because I can't see uh, your faces. Um, so if, if the topic is, like, slow, boring, you can move, move past it. I have a lot of slides here. Cool, thank you. Um, so. So the problem, so like you, you set up, uh, so like to compute online features, um, some companies we see that they set up a Lambda microservice to they just compute uh, the recent number of views. Um, so the problem with Lambda is that it's, it's not stateful, uh, so it's stateless. So like if you want to compute the number of views an item has in the last 30 minutes, you will need, um, so like, and if the, if the, if the views come in like every minute, you, um, one way is that like every time you want the number of views in the last 30 minutes, you just like go over the last 30 minutes. Um, but you might want to just like every minute, you just want to update, uh, calculate the number of views in the last minute and then, and then combine it with the number of views in the last 29 minutes. So, um, so, so, that, so like with Lambda function, we need to set up an external um, database to store the state of the um, of the com computations. So um, a much more efficient way could be like to use stream computations engines such as Flink. And also, um, and Matei just uh, mentioned that um, Databricks also have Spark streaming. So yeah, so, so that's what for online features. So, so, so the feature service here, so, so you can see that there's a difference from batch prediction to online prediction with batch features and online prediction with online features. The key difference is in the feature service. And feature service, a lot of companies we talked recently are looking into what is called like feature store. Um, so, so for this to work, a feature store or like feature service, we need certain properties. So one is that it needs to be able to connect to different data sources, like both offline, like batch data sources, like data warehouse, Snowflake, BigQuery, and streaming data sources like Kafka, uh, Kinesis. So, so yeah, that's one requirement for uh, for a feature store is that a uh, dual, um, uh, dual data, uh, like multiple data source connections. And another is that it would need to be able to store feature definitions. So for example, like if you want to specify that, oh, we want the number of views of a product has in the last 30 minutes, then you might want to, uh, so, so you need to define that uh, query somehow. It can either be in, um, um, in SQL or in, uh, in like pandas um, or like data frames, or it can also be in like PySpark. So the feature store will need to be able to like store these definitions and compute that, which brings us to the next requirements of the re feature store is feature computations. Um, so they have feature definitions and have data source. So you want to apply these feature definitions to the data sources 
to get the computed features. So in, in a lot of um, feature stores that I have seen, um, they very light on feature computations and uh, especially on the streaming part because um, streaming is hard. And I see the feature store um, tend to leverage um, tools like uh, Spark streaming, which is, is um, which I think is a great addition to Spark. But I think uh, there are, is still a lot to be desired about Spark streaming, and um, there have. But luckily, there have been a lot of exciting tools that allow us to do stream computations um, very efficiently, like vectorized, uh, materialized, and decodable. Oof, did somebody say burn? Uh, no, I mean, Spark streaming is great. I have a lot of respect for for it. Brick is it's an amazing company, um, but but it breaks does come from a batch computations. Um, uh, background, so it's, it definitely takes time, so it can definitely become a great streaming combination engine. Oh gosh, I hope that Mate is not in the talk and that doesn't hate me. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so another is that like after you compute uh, these features, you might want to persist the features, um, you might want to persist the computed features for either reusing for the next predictions um, request. Because um, you know, like sometimes you might uh, different prediction requests might want to access the same feature, or different models might want to have the same features. So if you persist certain computed features, you can reuse them for future prediction requests, or you can also reuse them for when you want to retrain the model on new data. So, um, um, so so yeah, so 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 in this case, if you want to persist computed features, then feature store is more like a data mart, like more database. It's a store like pre-computed features. Um, and I think like another thing that people have been talking about a lot is to ensure the consistency between training and serving for predictions. So here we have this diagram for for online predictions. So uh, so online prediction is um, so so in in this. Um, so batch features is pretty consistent between uh, you can do it uh, predict um, for, for uh, you, you can um, use the same batch by life for both um, uh, for both uh, for for batch features in serving and training. However, for for the online features, that's where it gets tricky. So in online features um, during predictions, we might want to use stream computations for to get the features. But when training for the same features, we want might you want to use a batch process. So a lot of um, a big promise of the modern feature store it is to help you ensure the consistency of the features during predictions and also during training. So um, so so like I think it's a very difficult topic because like if you compute the training features in the in the feature store, then yes, it can reuse the same feature definitions and it go back in time to generate historical features. But if you generate training features outside feature store, then it can be very hard to ensure the consistency. Um, and and one, one last point that I want to talk about on the feature store or a feature service is that um, when we generate batch features offline, like for example, after we generate embedding offline, we might want to um, we might we might be able to do a lot of tests to make sure that the embeddings make sense. But if we do online uh, generate online features online and we reuse and we use that immediately for predictions, then we need to have some way to ensure that these online features have good quality and they are not just like there's not something like breaks in the pipeline to lead to the wrong features. So that's the last aspect of the feature store functionality is feature monitoring to ensure that every feature generated um, in the feature store, the feature service uh, will be usable and like correct or like within certain expectations. Um, so, so yeah, so I think um, for, for this key functionality of feature store, um, I think just like there, so the things in blue, that what I, what I believe that feature stores today are doing really well, like connecting to different data sources, um, get a storing feature definitions, or like persisting computed features. However, there's still, I think there's still a lot of room for like other functionality, like feature computations, or like change of feature consistency, and like feature monitoring. And, um, and it's very, very likely that uh, a lot of modern feature store like Tekton win, um, and I, I think like I think a lot of future stores are like actually working on this, uh, and I'm very excited to see where the future stores are gonna go. Okay, so we talk about future of monitoring, which brings us to the next topic of um, 
monitoring. So, so the first question, um, I think we're going to go through this quickly. So the first question we talk, we need to address when talking about monitoring is what to monitor. So what companies really care about um, is when, when they have a machine learning model is business metrics, like um, F1 accuracy, click-through rate. So however, like to, it's, it's pretty hard to monitor the business metrics directly because usually you would need a lot of like labels or feedback from users. And not every task has um, labels or feedback from users immediately that we can use to monitor the models. So, so, so like um, one, one way to get around it is that like, companies try to collect as much feedback as possible. So for example, for e-commerce, um, you can't leverage users' feedback to like as a proxy to see how the models is performing. So for example, like if you do recommended systems, you might want to look into is the feedback like click or like adding an item to cart or like whether user buy an item or like whether they return an item. So like this different feedback through the user's journey um, have different properties. So for example, click through rate, uh, clicks um, is a lot more, they are a lot, so user click on items a lot. So that means that clicks are very dense um, a very dense feedback. However, click is not a very strong signal. So you might not have a lot of clicks, but like a user clicking on an item doesn't mean that the users realize that item. Um, however, like for purchase, like buying item is a lot more sparse because like it doesn't happen a lot. However, um, it's a very strong signal. So like companies will have to decide on like what kind of feedback that they want to actually monitor. And another thing when monitor um, business metrics is that you, you care about the five grade evaluations. Like one overall metrics like accuracy or F1 on own data is not gonna be good enough. And you want to know like how a model is performing for like different uh, sub, uh, subset of the data. So, uh, so, so for example, like if, um, so first of all, what we want to know whether the model is performing well, like equally well across all demographics, or like if there's certain like, or if slightly change for a subgroup of users, then there might be something uh, interesting happening there. It can be something very bad, like some biases um, in the pipeline. So because of the lack of labels and um, and predictions, so. A lot, so a lot of monitoring tools turn to monitor proxies like predictions and features. So the assumption here is that it shift in predictions and feature distributions will also lead to decreased business metrics. So in this case, monitoring now becomes a distribution now becomes a problem of detecting distribution shifts. So um, so that leads us to the next question: like how do we detect data distribution shift? So, um, so, um, so usually, like, if we have like um, two populations, we want to determine whether these two populations come from the same distributions. Or the alternate question is like, how do we determine that the two distributions, are, uh, two distributions are different? So the two, uh, two, uh, um, the two distributions might be one of them might be the distributions of training data, and another distribution might be the prediction during product uh, production data, or it can be like uh, one distributions might be the distribution from yesterday and another distribution is uh, the distribution from today. So um, those are the base distributions that we compare the other distribution to is called the source distributions and the distribution that we care about to see whether it has deviated from, from the source distribution is called the target distribution. Um, so, so there are two main approaches uh, to detect the data distribution shift. One is to compare by comparing statistics, and another is by using two simple hypothesis testing, such as like case test or like uh, MMT. So compare statistics means that, um, so you would compare certain statistics of the source distributions, like mean variance, uh, mean max, and you see this like, and you also compare, uh, com uh, compute the same statistics of the target distributions. And you see that if the statistics have diverged, from the target distribution to the source distribution, then you can say that oh, the distributions have shifted. Uh, two sample hypothesis test is a uh, is more involved. Um, so the problem with statistic approach is that it's very distribution dependent. So um, so so for example, like um, 
you should only compute statistics that are meaningful to your distributions. So for example, if your distribution is a normal distribution, then means and variance can be very helpful. But if your distribution is something like a long tail distribution, then it's probably not a very a means or variance. It's not going to be a good statistic. And another problem with statistic or comparisons uh, approach is that um, it's inconclusive. So like if the means of variance like statistics have shifted from the source distribution to the target distribution, then we can say that the distribution has shifted. However, if the statistics are still the same, then we can't really say that the, the distribution has not shifted. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and the two sample hypothesis test um, is pretty common. Um, however, like the vast majority of hypothesis tests today uh, can only work with like low dimensional data. So usually like to compute the hypothesis test. Um, so, so it doesn't work for high dimensional data like embeddings. So people usually tend to first perform dimensional reductions on high dimensional data before they switch, uh, before they apply hypothesis test. So um, when talking about detecting shifts, we have uh, um, it's important to note that like not all shifts are equal. Some shifts are easier to detect than other. So for example, sudden shifts are a lot more, a lot easier to detect than gradual shift. So imagine we have some distribution that changes like this. So it's very gradual change. So like if you're comparing the, the data today to data yesterday, you might not see a lot of change and you might think that, oh, there's no shift. But over time, because the, the shifts are very continual, gradual, um, like after a week, the shift might have changed significantly, but you might not you might not be able to check it. Um, the difference, another difference is that um, um, spatial shift uh, versus temporal shift. So spatial shift happens when um, you have like pretty much um, like new access point. For example, like uh, the users may have new devices. So before they were using the applications on desktop, but now they use applications on mobile phone. And users' behavior on mobile phones are very different from user behaviors on desktop. Uh, or another type of spatial shift is when you have new users. For example, you might launch a new marketing campaign and you suddenly get users from an entirely different demographics that you had before. So now you have like a lot of new users, uh, you know, a lot of users, so like a spatial shift. Um, on the other hand, temporal shift is when you have the same users, same device, but behaviors that change over time. So, um, so temporal shift are like really tricky to detect. So for temporal shift is times window scale really matter a lot. So consider we have a distribution that looks like this, so like across like 15 days, right? And we want to use a day 15 as a target distribution. So if we just look at the last, uh, say, um, last six days as the source distribution, then we see that, oh, day 15 looks significantly different from day 9 to day 14, then it's a shift. However, if we use the day 1 to day 14 as a source distribution, then we can see that, oh, day 15 is the spike and day 15 is just like expected. So this is not um, a distribution shift. Um, yeah, so so um, so so like time scale window is very very important, and there are two things. It's like choosing the right time window for distribution shift is very hard because like if we have too short time window, we can have a lot of forms of alarm. Like this case, when we think it's a shift, but it's not a shift. It's just a cyclic nature of your data. Um, whereas if you choose a time window that is too long, then it might take too long for us to detect uh, the shift which is not a good thing either. So, um, so a lot of stream processing tools um, allow us to do something called a merge profile. So you, you can start, we can start with monitoring metrics, uh, information statistics at a, at a small time window like hourly. And then we can merge 24 hours, uh, 24 of the hourly windows into a bigger profile of like daily. So that is very, very convenient, it's great. Um, and I have seen that some tools like Mona Labs, they have this um, root cause analysis when they automatically analyze various window size to have you de uh, determine exact point in time where the shift happens. Um, so we talk about like uh, two kind of proxies that uh, companies use to monitor their machine learning systems when they don't have enough labels and, um, and feedback. 
is that uh, predictions and features. So I'm a huge fan of margin predictions. So example of margin predictions is that like um, you can have some conditions like if predictions are on phones is the last 10 minutes and send an alert or like if three is still the most popular class like um, like if it's now no longer the most popular class, then you might see that there's something strange that has happened. So predictions, um, I like predictions because um, predictions are pretty low dimensional, so they are like easy to visualize, easy to compute stats, and also easy to do uh, two sample hypothesis tests on. Um, and also like changes in prediction distributions generally means changes in the data input distributions. However, keep in mind that uh, predictions shift. A prediction distribution shift can also be caused by canary roll now. So um, I, I, I'm not sure you, you're familiar with canary roll now. It's a case when you might want to roll out. So you have an existing model and you have a new model and you want to like run, slowly roll out your new model to more percentage of users. So you might first want to like serve the new model to 1% of users, then 10% and then to like 90% and then before 100%. So and this means that um, as you do carry run out, uh, you have the new model slowly replace the existing, existing model. So you might, uh, you might see distribution shift. So in this case, you still might want to investigate um, because as, uh, a lot of as, uh, like if the new model produce significantly different predictions from the as our existing models, then there might be some problem with the new model and you should definitely look into it. So for margin features, um, so this uh, so margin features um, is very similar to prediction as well, but it's a lot harder and a lot more complex. So for um, for a, a given features, uh, you might want to compute expected uh, statistics or schemas of that features. So usually, like uh, during training uh, for each feature, you might want to get the mean or variance of that feature. And then you monitor the mean and variance of that feature in production. And then if it's, um, if it changes, then you think that, oh, the distribution for that feature has shifted. So uh, you can have, like, ex here are some of the examples of the expect expectations for a feature that you can generate during um, training. So for example, like, um, take a big common sense feature, like, the, if, if the task is NLP, you might want to make sure that there is the most common word. Um, oh, it's NLP for English, and you know that there is a most common word in in English. So you see that, like, oh, if if there is no longer the most common word uh, of the data in production, then there might be a problem there. Uh, example, another example is that you might want to compute the mean, max, and uh, or median uh, value. You, you might want to, you might expect that the means or max of a features are in within range like A and B, and A and B's are the values that can compute it from the sort distribution or the training data distribution. So uh, margin features have a lot of challenges. So first is a compute in memory cost. Um, so so we, we don't have like, just one model in production anymore, like any interest. Um, so companies now, like the number of models in, in production is just increasing like crazy. So companies might have a lot of like models in production and each model might have a lot of features. So imagine you have a hundred models, each model has like a hundred features. So now we already have like a thousand features. So imagine just like computing, um, computing statistics for this thousand or 10,000 features like constantly uh, can be very, very costly and slow. It can eat up like on the our compute power. Um, so another is like the aliphatic. So when we have like a lot of features, like it's very likely like some features are gonna change. However, like most of the changes are just benign. But if we want to like send alerts to a like data scientist every time a feature change, we can have a lot of forced alarms. So like we can lead to something called like aliphatic. And another is just like uh, features um, usually like follow some expected schema. For example, like uh, if you compute like, oh, the, the median has to be within A and B. So A and B are the schema of that um, of the features. And this might change uh, as we update the model. Like if you have a new, if you train the model on new data, then the value A, B in change. So we need to somehow keep track of all this schema feature studies over time. And it can be like pretty hard um, for that. So um, the vast majority of the feature store of monitoring solutions nowadays focus on monitoring features. And 
so do feature store. So I think we see a lot of feature store that are um, are also adding the functionality to monitor features because feature store are already computing a lot of features values and persisting features values. So that could be a, a natural place to do monitoring as well. So the question is that like, um, Okay, I don't think I'm gonna make any statement here, but we I do see that a lot of um, converging conversions between monitoring solutions and feature store. And okay, I think that I don't have time. Thank you, Dee, for reminding me. But yeah, I think there's some uh, continued learning, but I don't think I'm gonna go through this. And yeah, I have a book coming out, um, and I hope that um, it's just coming out this week. And I hope that this. If you already order it, I hope that this talk doesn't make you cancel the order. Uh, but also reach out, like email, uh, Twitter to chat about any of the topics. Thank you. Awesome stuff, Chip. Do you got a few minutes to answer some questions? Yes, for you cool. anytime. Oh, <laughs> I love it. So we are asking questions in the Apply Conference channel. And there's a ton of them. I know we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I picked out a few that I really liked. And the first one is how do you, oh, sorry, wrong one. That was the wrong thread. It's um, can streaming data sources be joined together, i.e. two separate entities with a join key? Um, is it can be. But I think you need uh, joining on streaming is actually pretty hard. So that's why we see, uh, so like joining in, in SQL uh, tables, we, we have a lot of like optimizations for, for batch uh, joining, right? Um, I think we, we see a lot of movement recently in like streaming SQL um, as well. So, so I think Snowflake has, has a team now working on streaming. Uh, we have materialized, decodable. So um, yes, it's possible. But the question is how optimized the streaming joys are. And that way, um, that's why we see a lot of new tools coming in. Excellent. What about a recommendation for a feature store for small teams? I see the value prop in enabling much faster iteration, but the fear, yeah. the maintenance and over-engineering as a team of four. So that's a good question. Um, um, so I think like, uh, there are a lot of options for a feature store. Um, I would say that like depending on your need, um, like whether the complexity of the features. So like if you don't like if you mostly have like batch features loading into like online key value store, like Redis, DynamoDB, then it can probably build something in-house. But if you have like you if you have like streaming features, but it's like simple streaming features, like just um uh, computing the number of views a product has in the last 30 minutes. So then you can probably get away with like a uh, spot streaming or like some Lambda um, microservice. Uh, however, like we talk to companies, like especially in FinTech, when they have extremely complex streaming features, then you need a very good streaming computation engine. So I would say that's like, um, um, then, then that is harder. I, I don't see a lot of um, feature stores that can do complex streaming computations very well yet. Um, and also I think I heard some complaints about feature store. I'm sorry, Mike, I know that you're the call. I know Tekton is incredible. And I, I, I think I have heard really good things about Tekton. Uh, one thing people do complain though, is just like it's very integration heavy. So like the integrations, um, so like if you have a small team for people, uh, I'm not sure like whether, um, well, what is the integration timeline gonna be for you? Mm. So, Last one before we jump, how do you scale serving when the scale is not worth the number of requests the model gets, but it is with the number of models to serve? I'm sorry, some can you repeat the question? Yeah, so oh, I think there needs yeah. to be some context here. Uh, large, over 10,000 models, all models use text as the only input. Uh, yeah. How do you scale serving when the scale is not with the number of requests the model gets, but it is with the number of models to serve? Also, how would you effectively monitor drift for a large number of models? Can it be so done have a, in near real time? So you have a lot of models. Yeah. Are it's they over um, 10,000? Well, are they like, um, so this is an NLP. Uh, so are you using some kind of embeddings, uh, like pre built? Um, Retrain model for the NLP model? Vishal, this one's on you. Let's see what he says. 
Uh, I'm seeing something. Yes, he is. So, uh, okay. So, um, are you like deploying this model separately or are you like having one container for like one of this 10,000 models? Custom serving built to handle this and he uses embeddings plus another model. Um, I think like this, uh, we, we actually work with a few companies that have a similar uh, patterns, like uh, especially B2B companies. So uh, we've seen that B2B companies, uh, they might have like a separate model for each customer. So if you have like 10,000 customers and you can easily have 10,000 models. And that actually required a really um, interesting solutions. Um, and the solution is not just in like scaling the prison service, but also in like managing all the features, retrain our model retraining, because you don't want to like manually retrain each of these models separately. But yeah, yeah, do reach out. And so I feel also I feel lucky bad about like I hope that I didn't like bath now any of the tool. I know like they are bricks and tech on an incredible company. Like Mike and Mate are amazing. And I think they definitely like um one of the best ML op tools thing out there. And I only think it said about like the limitations are not because of the companies themselves. It's just like the space is very complex right now. And a lot of problems don't have good solutions yet, but I know that uh, they are working on it. And I'm very excited to see um, the solutions, uh, like the future of these solutions.